Hey guys, how are you doing today? Uh, thank you very much for coming. My name is Thomas Neeld. I am very excited to talk to you about mathematical modeling with Kotlin today. We are going to talk about a fun range of topics uh, from optimization to machine learning, and we'll kind of go full circle and talk about how these two domains related. And of course, all these examples are built in Kotlin. They are all open source. They're all on GitHub. And I'll kind of give a whirlwind tour of these different, uh, these different kinds of problems and how to solve them. So there's a lot of material I need to cover, so I'll just go ahead and zoom right past uh, this page. So my name is Thomas Sneald. I'm a business consultant at Southwest Airlines. I live in Dallas, Texas. I work in the department that comes up with airline schedules and tries to optimize them. And I also contribute to a number of open source projects, including RX Kotlin and Kotlin Statistics and Tornado FX. And I've written two books, Getting Started with SQL and Learning Rx Java. If you really like this talk and you want to learn more about these topics, uh, definitely check out my YouTube channel. I'm trying to do a new mathematical modeling with Kotlin topic every two to three weeks, usually about optimization or machine learning right now. And uh, there's my GitHub and Twitter handle as well. This is the agenda for today. We are going to talk about why mathematical modeling and then we're going to go into two topics, uh, discrete optimization as well as machine learning. And we're going to talk about how these two domains related. I have a few slides and to show the concept and deconstruct the algorithms and how they work. And we'll use a mixed approach of using you know, libraries and also building from scratch. I'll try to open up the black boxes as much as I can. So what is mathematical modeling? So it's used in a wide range of applications and in industries from biology to medicine to engineering, business, and economics. It is also the backbone to optimization, machine learning, and data science. And we're going to go through a couple of real world examples. Hopefully, you might find some use in them and to solve practical problems. We're going to talk about scheduling, you know, such as staff, resource, classrooms, uh, server jobs, et cetera. And we'll also talk about like game AI, such as like Sudokus or chess. We'll go through a Sudoku example later. And we'll talk about how that algorithm can actually be used to solve scheduling problems as well, uh, even the most gnarly ones. And we'll also talk about text categorization. And it will even go into uh, neural networks. So a lot to cover in 45 minutes, but I think we can do it. So, as, and then another reason to learn mathematical model, reason to learn mathematical modeling is as programmers, we thrive in certainty and exactness. We like it when all of our unit tests pass. We like it when every element in a collection is present. We like it when things just line up perfectly and are very deterministic. However, the valuable high profile problems today, they often tackle uncertainty and approximation. And this is a very fun problem space where there's not necessarily a clear answer. You're inevitably going to have some margin of error, but the idea is to get as close to the optimal solution as possible, especially when you have very large search spaces. And another reason, technology, frameworks, and languages come and go, but math never changes. Some of the techniques I'm going to show you have been around for decades, some even, you know, and some, and some concepts are even centuries old, and they don't get deprecated and abandoned. I mean, people expand them, they find new ways to apply it, so this is a great thing to always fall back on in your career, especially when it gets exhausting, always learning new technologies. You can always have that mathematical skill set, and not many people know it, and therefore, it's a great thing to fall back on. By all means, keep learning new technologies and everything, but the mathematical modeling space is a lot of fun. So we're going to talk about discrete optimization first. This is a space of algorithms that tries to find a feasible or optimal solution to a problem that has constraints on it. Uh, so problems such as scheduling classrooms, staff, transportation, even sports teams and tournaments, as well as manufacturing, it can also be used to solve problems such as vehicle routing or trying to find a way to optimize you know, the, the path within a warehouse for a stock picker, whether it's a machine or a person. Or you're trying to, I don't know, optimize a ride sharing service and trying to find the most efficient routes. You can also use it to optimize manufacturing operations or even use it for like Sudoku or Chess AI. I'm going to try not to use that word AI too much. I'm not, a, not big on that buzzword. I'll explain why later. So discrete optimization, it's a mixed bag of algorithms and techniques. And you can either build these from scratch or with the assistance of a library. And I'll kind of take both approaches. So first problem that we're going to talk about is the traveling salesman problem. Uh, this is one of my favorite problems. And sorry. So this is one of my favorite problems. Um, and it's one of the most elusive and studied computer science problems since the 1950s. The objective is very simple. Uh, find the shortest round trip tour across several geographic points in cities. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Ooh. <laughs> Murphy's Law. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so traveling salesman problem. Uh, the find the shortest round trip tour across several geographic points and cities. So very simple objective, however, very difficult to actually execute. Just 60 cities, that yields 8.3 times 10 to the 81st possible tours. So to put it in perspective, that's more tour combinations than there are observable atoms in the universe. So trying to brute force this is not an option. That could take a really, really long time. By a long time, I mean centuries or just non really long time. So let me go ahead and switch over to this demo I built. And again, this is all open sourced on GitHub. So here's a map of Europe. I think I have 25 points here. I need to find the shortest round trip tour to visit all of them. So one of the first approaches you may try is you might do a greedy algorithm where you'll start at a random point. I'm going to kick this off. And you'll jump to the next closest point, next closest point, next closest point. However, this backfires really quickly because, as you can see, it has a lot of overlaps. And when you see overlaps, that means you have a very bad solution because uh, we don't want overlaps. And by the way, I implemented this in Tornado FX. A lot of my examples are using Tornado FX for the UI. So, one, so one, one approach we can take, we can implement a very simple algorithm, and I'll expand on it for the next one, is we can do something called a k-opt or a two-opt algorithm where I will generate a random itinerary that's not optimal at all. But then I'm going to take two random uh, edges or segments, and if I can swap them in a way that improves the distance, then I'll take it. And so I do this for so many iterations until finally I can't improve anymore. So as you can see here, we actually have something that's a little bit better. Uh, so there's no overlaps, and after so many iterations, it finally came up with a decent solution, uh, 18,501 kilometers. However, we can do better. I'm pretty confident the global, the minimum we can achieve is 17,509. So, let's look at what happened here. So, here's just a very abstract graph of the various tour configurations we can achieve as well as the tour distance. So, what happens is we have all these local minima. The lowest one is called the global minimum. That's ideally where we want to be at, but sometimes we have to settle for the best we can. And what happens is our two opt algorithm is swapping two random edges at a time, but then ultimately it gets stuck. And it gets stuck in those local minima, those valleys, and it only sees one move ahead, and it can't see any one move ahead to make an improvement, so it says, okay, I'm good here. However, we really want to be here, ideally at the global minimum. We'll also settle for being here, because that's still much better than what we have right now. And when you're dealing with more permutations and there are atoms in the universe, we'll settle for good enough rather than optimal. So how do we escape? So let's make the algorithm slightly less greedy. So occasionally, we will allow a marginally inferior move to find superior solutions. And so how exactly do we execute this? So we want to maintain the greedy nature, but we want to sprinkle in some randomness here and there so that it is, so we shake this, uh, this ball out of its valley, more or less, and hopefully find something better. So we can actually implement this by, let me go ahead and show a Desmos graph real quick. <laughs> so try not to be too intimidated. What I have here is I just have this degrading, so th this is my degrading distance, 18,180. This is my current, which is 18,000. So this is when I encounter a swap that's inferior. But what I can do is I can use this function I plotted right here to figure out whether I take that random move or not. And so, if the, and I have right here on the x-axis this thing called temperature, which is just a number. And I plug that temperature into that function. At the temperature 60 degrees, there is a four point, uh, about approximately a 5% chance I'll take that solution or take that swap. And what I can do is I can fluctuate this temperature up and down to fluctuate between greediness and randomness. And so if my temperature is really high, such as 120, there's a 22% chance I will take that degrading move. And one other aspect to this function as well, so the more distance I put bet between the degrading move and the current configuration, the less probability I'm going to take that move. So if it's a really drastic jump or, it, or if it makes the solution much, much worse, there's a less probability I'm going to take it, because you'll see that probability going down. But 
the more marginal the, the, degra the degradation is, the smaller the, the difference, the more likely I am to take that move. So how exactly do I execute this on the Kotlin side? So going into the source code, so I have an enumerable holding every implementation, the two opt algorithm I just showed you. That's all it took to do that one. And then the simulated annealing, I generate the temperature schedule right here. So I start at a temperature of 80 and step it down by 0 0.005. And I take that until finally it reaches 50. And then I shoot from 50 back up to 120, stepping by 0 0.05. And then I go from 120 down to 0 0.005 again. So I start at a temperature, heat it up, or sorry, I cool it down, then I heat it up again, which again, the heat corresponds to the randomness. And then I cool it down again and make it greedy again. And I sample two random edges. And then I take, if the current distance, if, it, if that opt, if that two-off swap improves the distance, I'll take it. But if I encounter a degrading move, I'll pass that uh, formula I just showed you in that graph to here with that temperature. And I pass it to a weighted coin flip function, which is just a coin that you know, is biased towards a true probability that I specify based on that temperature. And if it's less than the true probability, I'll take it. And so. Let's go ahead and see how the simulating works. Simulated annealing works out. So start out with the random itinerary. And then I'm going to take two random edges, but occasionally I'm going to take a marginally inferior one based on this temperature you see over here on this bar. And so the more the temperature goes down, the more greedy it becomes. But when I fluctuate that temperature back up, it will start becoming random again, then it will cool down again. So what that effectively does is it kind of shakes that ball out of that valley and hopefully find a better solution. So as you can see here, it got stuck, but now I'm raising the temperature again to kind of shake up this uh, itinerary and try to find swaps here and there that might improve it a little bit more. And now it should, now it should fall back down, and then that's it. So it's now going back to, at some point in that search, a better solution it found. And sure enough, it landed at 17,509. Now, we may not always get that answer, but we'll get really close to it, at least. So that is the traveling salesman problem. I also have on GitHub um, this traveling salesman plotter tool where you can plot random points, mess around with it, and see what kind of itinerary it generates and how much distance. So you're welcome to play with that as well. I'll also accept PRs because there's still a little bit of more work I need to do, but it works for the most part now. OK, so let's move on to another problem. And the source code's right there. And that's a really funny XKCD cartoon. So let's talk about a, another practical problem. Oh, I should probably emphasize the traveling salesman, it actually is very relevant and uses a benchmark for solving like transportation problems, uh, even different optimization algorithms out there. Uh, people actually have done research trying to use a neural network to solve the traveling salesman problem, but they got very suboptimal uh, results with it. It's interesting that people do that academically, but it's not something you want to use in practice. So let's talk about scheduling next. So here's a really fun, gnarly problem that some of you might have encountered at some point or wondered about before. So you need to generate a schedule for a single classroom. I'll show multiple classrooms later, conceptually. And you need to schedule these following classes. They have different durations, uh, different recurrences. So some need to happen once a week. Some need to happen three times a week. And we'll assume that there's a day gap in between each one and that they're all going to be at the same time. And the available scheduling times are Monday through Friday, 8 AM to 11.30 AM, 1 PM to 5 PM. And the slots are scheduled in 15-minute increments. So I have not found any documentation on how to solve this particular problem when I first kind of contrived it for myself, just out of curiosity. And so I probably wasted 100 sheets of paper coming up with proofs and diagrams trying to find a model that actually worked. And I was very compulsive about it. And then finally, I, I found something that actually is pretty straightforward, and I'm happy to share it with all of you. So this is how you can implement this. So first, visualize a grid of each 15-minute increment from Monday through Sunday intersected with each possible class. And that intersection is going to be a 1 or a 0, indicating whether that's the start of the first class. So you can see here, I have my classes aligned on vertically. And I also have each time slot horizontally. And at each intersection, that, rep that represents, if it's a 1, that that's going to be the start of the first class, the first recurrence. 
Now, visualize how overlaps will occur next. So notice how a 9 a.m. Psych 101 class will clash with a 9.15 Sociology 101. So again, looking just at the 9.45 a.m. block, you will see if there's a 9 a.m. Psych 101 and a 9.15 Sociology 101, that causes the 9.45 to become occupied by two classes, and that's not what we want. You can kind of think of it, anything that touches that 9.45 a.m. block, the sum of those slots must be no more than one. And same thing if, it's, uh, if Sociology 1 is at 9.45, or, or sorry, 9.30 or 9.45. But the moment we push that Sociology out to 10 a.m., everything's good. The sum of all the affecting slots on the 9.45 a.m. block is one. So that is how we think about our constraints. So for every block, we must sum all the affecting slots shaded below. And I got those just on the class durations. Which, and the sum of all this blue shaded area for this 9.45 AM must be no more than one. And so if all the sum of all those is no more than one, then that 9.45 AM block is OK. And we do that for every single block. We look at all the shaded regions of things that affect it, or slots that affect it and say it must be no more than one. And so, actually, let me go ahead and pull up this image. We can take this concept a little bit further and not just account for the durations, but also the recurrences. So this shows the entire week. And notice if a linear algebra 101 starts at 8 a.m. on Monday, that actually will occupy the 9.45 a.m. slot on Friday. So you can kind of expand that constraint to account for not just the class durations, but also the recurrences, and say the 9.45 a.m. block is affected by all of those blue slots right there, and they must sum to no more than one. So when I run it, so when I plug this into OJ Algo, or I solve it from scratch, which I'll show up, I have both approaches on GitHub. So put these variables in, and feasible constraints to the optimizer means something that it can actually solve, and you will get a solution. And so most of the work is actually just querying out those affecting slots and saying the sum of all these must be no more than one. And if I run, so if I run an algorithm, so if I run this algorithm, this is the output. This took about four minutes to run. I just ran it in advance to save time. And as you can see here, that's the that is the output, and that diagram I just showed you, that was the class output. And what I did, so what I did here is on the slot class, I declare an OG algo variable, so I kind of improvised a DSL. And then if that, if that block is within the operating day, so it's between 8 and 5 o'clock, not on the lunch, it's not at midnight, I'll make it a binary, you know, a 1 or a 0. Otherwise, I'm just going to set it to 0 and say, don't even consider it at all. And I do a few other things um, with OJ Algo to kind of guide the algorithm to certain solutions and to reduce the search space. For instance, if it's a three recurrence class, that needs to happen on a Monday because if it's any other day of the week, those three recurrences won't fit. So I basically set for those slots that have three recurrences, they must sum to one uh, on the Monday. And that way, that won't consider the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday for the three recurrence classes. And so that is, my, that is my entire domain model right there. And most of the work, like I said, was um, trying to grab those, those, class, those slots that affect a given block. And that's why I implemented these extension functions to get the rolling batches or the rolling recurrences. And we'll go and find all elements you know, based on their indexes that affect this given element. Okay, so one question you might have is like, okay, so how do I, what about those ones or zeros? How are those actually calculated? I have all those constraints. I pass them to OJ Algo, and it will solve those ones and zeros for me based on those constraints. But if you want to implement it from scratch, uh, it's actually not too hard to do um, if you're comfortable with a little bit of recursion. But let me go ahead and show a different example to explain that. Oh, and if you want to, multi if you want to schedule multiple rooms, just plot your uh, binary variable against three dimensions, the room, the class, as well as the time, and then build your constraints around that. And that's the source code. So I want to tangent into a different example to kind of show how to do a, take this uh, mixed integer programming approach I'm showing you from scratch. So imagine you're presented a Sudoku. Hopefully Sudoku is a familiar game puzzle. Every row, column, and square of nine cells must have the numbers one through nine. And you had, some of those numbers are pre-populated already, but you need to solve for the other ones. So rather than do an exhaustive brute force search, 
Think in terms of constraint programming to reduce the search space. Now, the first thing you want to do is you want to sort the cells by the count of possible values they have left. This is known as a heuristic, meaning that we are prioritizing the order that we are evaluating and searching the search space. So if we start with the most constrained items first, for instance, 4, 4, that cell only has one possible value, it's 5. And then we sort those values based on the number of possible values that are left to consider. That is, one of the, that is the first strategy we need to do. And then we take that list and we create a tree that explores each Sudoku cell and its possible values. And this technique is called branch and bound or branch and prune in this case. So if you look at this tree, compare it to the sorted list, maybe you can see what's going on. So 4, 4, that can only be a 5, as we see here. 2, 6 can only be 7, 3, 4, et cetera. When we get to the 1, 4, that is where we start branching out different paths. So if we explore the 1, 4 being 2, then we move on to the 0, 7. It's like, OK, that can be 2 or 3. And if it's 3, 3, 2, that, I'm going to explore it being 3, 4, 2. Excited being 3. But then I prune right there and stop that branch, because I'm like, oh, wait. I just assigned a 3 to this, to this uh, column 2. Uh, right here in this cell, so I don't have to search that branch anymore because I know already it's failed. And it's already, it's already broken my Sudoku, so I stop that branch and then I move my recursion over to the next alternative branch. So a branch should terminate immediately when it finds an infeasible configuration and then explore the next branch. When you have a value for every single cell, your branch reads 81 values and they're all feasible, then you have solved your Sudoku, and you just collapse it back into the game board. So I actually do have a Sudoku right here, and I have an OJ algo implementation as well as the uh, branch and bound version I built from scratch. Hit solve, it ran it immediately. And if you look at my code, I have the different, I have the different implementations in an enumerable, and I have this class called a grid cell branch, which represents a tip of a branch, and it has all the values that have been explored up to that point. And it allows me to traverse backwards, get those slots, get the entire row, entire column, entire square of values that have been assigned so far. And I can use that to drive whether my constraints have been met and whether it's continuable based on those constraints. And then but also whether it's the solution. And you'll see here, that's where I sort my, can my cells by the number of candidates they have. And then here's this recursive algorithm called traverse. And then I seed it right here, starting with the first value in that sorted list. Oops. and then I seed it with it. And that's where I start my recursive process right here. And then I apply it back to the game board. So the reason why I bring up the Sudoku is because you can actually use that same methodology to solve the scheduling problem from scratch as well, to solve for those one or zero values. And you want to sort those slots by how constrained they are, or what is the most likely solution first. So for instance, the three recurrence classes, I will sort the slots that puts them in a Monday first and evaluate those first just to get them out of the way in the search, and that way they won't be considered for the rest of the uh, branch and bound tree. And, I also, and the, from, the from scratch solution for the scheduling problem I just showed you is on GitHub, and so is the Sudoku. So before we move on to machine learning, uh, just to summarize, discrete optimization is a best kept secret uh, well known in operations research. And as we'll discover later, machine learning itself is often an optimization problem, uh, finding the right variables uh, to minimize an error function. And a lot of folks think of neural networks, you know, when they think of, you know, like a way to solve problems that are non-deterministic. But hopefully what I showed you is like, okay, I can actually see a large problem space I would use this for. And two recommended Java libraries I recommend, OJ Algo, which I use in many examples in this presentation, as well as OptiPlanner. And if you want to learn more about discrete optimization, that Coursera class right there is the best resource. It's probably the only thorough but effective resource I have found. Uh, it will challenge your programming skills most likely, and if you're, not if you're not comfortable with recursion, you will get comfortable with recursion in that class. <laughs> that book is pretty, pretty great as well. All right, so let's move on to the machine learning section of the talk. And we're going to start with Naive Bayes, and then we're going to talk about neural networks. So probably the most common task in machine learning is classifying data. So how do I identify images of dogs versus cats? And again, these are categories. We're looking at data, and we're, we're trying to assign a category to it. What words are being said in a piece of audio? 
words are categories too. Is this email spam or not spam? Um, you can also, also, if you guys have ever watched that HBO show, Silicon Valley, the hot dog, not hot dog problem, that's also a categorization. Uh, what attributes define high risk, medium risk, and low risk applicants? And how do I predict if a shipment will be late, early, or on time? So as you can see, there is, categorization is a very large part of machine learning and data science problems. Not all, but a huge part of it. And there are many techniques to do this. Uh, and there's pros and cons depending on the nature of the data, the nature of the task. I mean, there's support vector machines, decision trees, random forest, XGBoost, linear and nonlinear regression. Uh, however, today I want to talk about two. Uh, Naive Bayes, which is very simple to implement. You can actually do it from scratch pretty easily, as well as neural networks. So we'll start with Naive Bayes. And it's used for a very common task, which is text categorization. And it's an, ad it's an adaptation of Bayes' theorem that can predict a category C for an item T with multiple features F, speaking in Java or Kotlin generics. And a common usage of naive Bayes is using email spam, where each word is a feature, and spam, not spam, are the possible categories. Uh, that's a kind of a spam and not spam. That's kind of a cliche example, so I'm going to do one that's a little bit more interesting. So I have another 20OFX application I built right here. And what I'm going to do is I have this CSV of different bank transactions with a memo and amount and date attached to each one. And I'm going to plug these in, and slowly over time, the algorithm is going to start predicting categories as I train it. And it will do it fairly quickly. So I'm going to plug in this first transaction, this grocery store visit. And notice it did not assign it a category. So I'm going to assign that one to be grocery. Then here's a coffee shop I visited. Again, it still doesn't know what the category is, so I'm going to say that's coffee. And then here is an Amazon sale. Again, it says I, I don't know, so I'm going to say that is electronics. Now, this is where things start to get interesting. Here is an Amazon video on demand transaction I did. And it categorizes electronics. And again, I am not using word lookups. It is dynamically figuring this out. And it saw the Amazon keyword and says, oh, oh, that's electronics. And I'm going to say, no, that's entertainment. But watch this. I'm going to put in Starbucks coffee, even though I've never done a Starbucks transaction before. It categorizes coffee. And it probably keyed off that Big B coffee transaction, and it saw the coffee keyword. And what's interesting is now here's a Redbox video rental. It figured that one out too. It said, oh, it's entertainment. And it probably figured that out for, based on the Amazon video on demand. And if I could put another Amazon transaction in, it's so like a vague, uh, ambiguous case, it'll categorize that as entertainment because it's using the probabilities of multiple words, not just one, to figure out which, one, which category it should select. So I have here. Um, so this is the likely category for a function where I pass the bank transaction. And I'm using Kotlin Statistics, which, has a, which is a library I, I built um, for a wide range of math problems. But naive base classifier is one thing I added this year. And you pass it a lambda that extracts the features, which in this case are just the words, which I'm extracting and cleaning up and uppercasing, or lowercasing, sorry. And I'm associating a category with each one. And then I can use that classifier to predict a new set of words or a new set of features and say, what category does this belong to? So the way I implement this, and this is actually easy enough to where you can implement this yourself in probably an hour. So Naive Bayes works by mapping probabilities of each individual feature occurring versus not occurring for a given category. Uh, so for instance, a word occurring in spam or not spam. So the way you break down this algorithm is for a given category, combine the probabilities of each feature occurring and not occurring respectively, by multiplying them. So the probability of feature one, uh, how often it occurs in a given category, times the probability of feature two, or the second word. And then you just multiply all of those together, and that will give you the occur product and the not occur product. So you're calculating the probability it belongs to a category, as well as the probability it does not belong to this category. And then you plug it into this formula right here, uh, where you sum the occur product, not occur product, and that's divided from the occur product. So simple enough. However, uh, due to com constrained computing resources, oh, and do this for every category and select the one with the highest probability. 
But you've got to deal with the floating point underflow issue. As you're combining and multiplying all of these probabilities together, you're going to run into a floating point underflow. So a mathematical hack you can do to get, get around that is transform each probability with a log or a natural log function. And because there's an additive property to, logarithm, to logarithms that effectively allows you to multiply but do it through addition, this kind of bypasses the floating point underflow issue or circumvents it. And then you can call the exponent function to convert the result back. And so that way you can add the decimals after they've been put through a logarithm. And you call exponent to convert the result back. And that achieves the exact same thing other than I avoid the floating point underflow. And one last little tweak you might want to do, never let a feature have a zero probability for any category. You don't want zero multiplication or division messing anything up. So add a small number to the numerator and denominator to that formula as well, like 0.5 and 1.0. And that is how you implement naive Bayes. That is the entire algorithm. And so it's not hard to implement yourself. And it's a great little tool for categorizing a set of features and seeing what category it belongs to. If you want to learn more about Bayes, uh, Brandon on YouTube, he works at Facebook uh, as a data scientist. He has some really great videos on various machine learning algorithms, including how Bayes works. Those are two great O'Reilly books as well. And there's a source code uh, for that bank transaction. As I also have an email spam classifier written in Colin as well. All right, here we go. Neural networks, these are what all the cool kids are doing now, right? So. Neural, neural networks are interesting and weird, and they do have some problem spaces they work really well in. And, and I'm sure everybody has seen like a neural network diagram at some point, and if it's ever like confused you or anything, hopefully I can help demystify a little bit today. And I also built a simple Kotlin application that uh, does a very simple example that will hopefully kind of open up the black box a little bit. So, but neural networks, they are a machine learning tool that takes numeric inputs and predicts numeric outputs. And then a series of multiplication, addition, and nonlinear functions are applied to those numeric inputs, and you iteratively tweak those until finally you get the desired numeric outputs you're looking for. You do that during the training phase, and as soon as it's trained, and you have the right math put in that black box, then you can use it to predict you know, new data coming for going forward. So here's a very, so, the way neural, so you have to structure your input data uh, to be numeric uh, to work with neural networks. So for instance, if you have a 128 pixel image, you need to grayscale that image and then you need to convert it down to the grayscale numeric values, like, you know, and then you plug those in as 128 numeric inputs. And if you're trying to figure out whether it's a dog or a cat in that image, you just have two numeric outputs and the highest number is the one it goes with. And each of those numbers corresponds with a dog or a cat. But let me do a much simpler problem. So suppose we wanted to take a background color, uh, such as this pink one right here, and we want to predict a light or dark font for it. And so that's the problem I want to solve. Now, I should say, if you search around Stack Overflow, there is a nice formula to do this. And if that, you plug in those RGB values, and if it comes up to less than 0.5, you should do a dark font, if I recall. And if it's greater than 0.5, then you'll make it a light font. However, what if we do not know this formula or one hasn't been discovered? And so ideally, you use neural networks to kind of surface models that we don't know about yet, or to surface, like, in, in it, for instance, this formula we have not uh, discovered yet. In practicality, a lot of people, even the people who design neural networks, have a very difficult time explaining why they work or why they don't work and what exactly is happening inside, um, just because there is a black box nature to them. And I'll kind of show why uh, next. So again, let's represent the background color as three numeric RGB inputs and predict whether a dark or light font should be used. So we plug those three RGB values, those numbers, into this black box, the mystery math, and it will shoot out two numbers. One number will recommend a light, light font. The other number will recommend a dark font. And the number that's the highest is the one that wins. And so here is what is going on in the middle. This is, this is a neural network with one layer in the middle. And this is the mystery math. And effectively what we do is we associate a weight uh, between every input node to every middle node. And then we multiply those weights by each numeric input values you can see um, right here. And then we sum them. So more or less do a dot product. But again, it's just a simple multiplication and addition operation. You're just doing it 
with a um, weight association between each uh, set of nodes. And we do the same thing again for this outer layer that recommends the, that recommends the whether it's a dark or light font, and we just multiply and sum those weights again with those resulting values. So, and each weight value is gonna be between negative one and one. So here's the million dollar question. What are the optimal weight values to get the desired output? So this is actually an optimization problem. And this is something I wish people would talk about more because a lot of machine learning algorithms are really just optimization problems. And you're trying to minimize the error, and by error or loss, I'm talking about, uh, as you can see in these two output values, that 0.01, it really ideally should be zero. So 0.01 is, so is the error difference, but it's still close enough to where we get the desired output, but we're trying to minimize that output's error you know, compared to what we want versus what we actually get after applying all this math. And so we need to solve for the weight values that gets our training colors as close to the desired outputs as possible. And just like the traveling salesman problem, you need to explore configurations seeking an acceptable local minimum. And there are many optimization techniques you can use. You can even use simulated annealing, which I showed for the traveling salesman earlier. However, the more mainstream way uh, to solve neural networks now is using gradient descent and various flavors of it, such as stochastic gradient descent and batch or mini batch gradient descent. And one thing you might want to consider as well is you might also consider using activation functions on each layer. So that middle layer, we're going to put a, and these are nonlinear functions that smooth, scale, or compress the resulting sum values. So in the middle layer, for every resulting product sum, we are going to apply the ReLU function on it to put a nonlinear nature on it. And same with the output layer, we're going to do a softmax. And these help make the network operate more naturally and smoothly. And that's how you can implement those four, the most four common activation functions used in neural networks. That's how you can implement them from scratch in Kotlin. As you can see, it's not terribly hard. And what the softmax does, the, soft, the softmax one is interesting because if you're, it's good for categorization and you put that on the output layer because it will take the highest value and push it up even more and it will dampen the lesser values to help that, that highest value stand out. And that's what the softmax does. And then sigmoid, it will compress the values between 0 and 1 to kind of make it resemble a probability, more or less, for any number. And tan h, it compresses it between negative 1 and 1. And ReLU uh, will just take all negative values and just zero them out. So let me go ahead and show the final example I have here. So this little dashboard right here, I have two sections. I have the train and I have the predict. And so I can go through this train section, it will show me random colors, and I get to choose whether a dark or light font will work with it. So I'm going to say, OK, uh, I think light works better for that one. Dark looks best, looks best. Light looks better. Light looks better. Light looks better. Dark looks better. And what I'll hope is that after I predict a color, so if I give it a, ba a black background color, well, unfortunately, it predicts a dark font color because I have not given enough data yet. So neural networks are very data hungry, and you have to give it a lot of data before they start making accurate predictions. And this is a very simple example, just predicting a font color you know, for a given background. So I have this uh, button right here that will train 1,345 pre-labeled colors for a light or dark font. I load those up, and look at that. It's actually making pretty good predictions right now on what font color to use. So, after I give it enough data, it does a pretty good job. And I have multiple implementations here, so I'm using OJ Algo's new Neural Network API, um, which is a pretty great library to use for very lightweight problems like this one. There's also Deep Learning 4J, which is the JVM's uh, equivalent to TensorFlow. I believe it's in beta right now. And uh, it's a very heavyweight library with a ton of dependencies, but it does some pretty impressive things on a very large scale. I also have my own implementation, which is just a simple feed forward. It doesn't really do the back propagation or gradient descent. I'll add that later. So that is so that is how neural networks work, more or less. So hopefully, you, hopefully the structure now makes sense. The middle layers are really what excites people or or what makes them so intriguing. It's like if I put like you know ten ten nodes in the middle, or if I put you know recurrent layers or all these other crazy configurations, that's where a lot of experimentation and research happens. 
So if you want to learn more about neural networks, uh, Make Your Own Neural Network, that book on the right, that is an excellent place to start. It's, it takes a very elementary approach, assumes you don't even know Python, so it teaches Python in a very minimal way. And it shows how to build a, neural, a very simple neural network from scratch. And Grokking Deep Learning, that is a great book to, when you want to graduate up and learn something more ambitious, that is a great book as well. And it kind of teaches you how to build uh, neural networks from scratch and kind of shows how they work and what, what are the use cases for different configurations. And I should, I should also add, you, ideally when you want to productionize something, you should, probably should use a library and rather than use your own implementations. It's very educational to use your own implementations because it kind of opens up the black box and you develop that intuition on how it works. But the, the libraries, they tend to be much more optimized and have a lot of really um, dedicated people working on it full time, uh, like Deep Learning 4J. So when you want to actually productionize something, I do recommend that. Oh, and Holger, thank you for putting those uh, examples, um, the Kotlin examples in the project for Deep Learning 4J. <laughs> um, and then also 3 Blue, 1 Brown on YouTube. That is a great YouTube video series as well covering neural networks. OK, so going forward. So if you get anything out of this talk, I hope the one thing you got is um, use the right AI for the job. So. So as you can see here, there are many different ways to solve a non-deterministic problem, and it really depends on the nature of the problem and what you have. So discrete optimization, that works best for, like, for scheduling, whether it's staff, transportation, classroom, server jobs, sports tournaments, route to optimization, as well as industry. And neural networks, uh, they tend to do well with fuzzy, difficult problems that have no clear model but lots of data. So things like self-driving vehicles, natural language processing, problems with mysterious unknowns, image audio vi video recognition, such as the cat and dog photo classifier. Now, the more categories you have to predict, that kind of makes the training that much more difficult. Because training images on cat and dog, you just have to have images for those two things. But the more categories you have, the more training you have to do for all those categories. And it also does some interesting applications for nonlinear regression as well. And then, Bayesian inf and then Bayes, it does a really good job with email spam, sentiment analysis, so trying to figure out whether this is a happy text, text message or, or body of text or a sad one or an angry one. And also it can be helpful for document summarization as well as probability inference. And this is the get all of these slides, all these uh, links are on GitHub, so feel free to check them out. And please download the slides and go through the appendix. I put a lot of fun stuff in there, like pop culture, areas to explore, libraries, online class resources, YouTube channels and videos, books, interesting articles, as well as papers, if you want to go down that rabbit hole. So thank you very much, guys. I, I'm very, it was a lot of fun speaking with you. And uh, if you have any questions, just please talk to me in the lobby. What's up? What, the GitHub? OK, sure. Yeah, I'll leave it on there. So thank you very much, guys. Enjoy the rest of the conference. And if you have any questions, just uh, talk to me in the lobby. Thank you.